Welcome to my course on Vue.js. In this course, we will get into the basics of web development using the Vue JavaScript framework. My intent is to make this a living course and keep my videos up to date with new Vue releases and adding projects along the way. So get it while it's free. I hope to see you in the next video. Hello there. Let's kick off with a formal introduction to Vue.js. Vue calls itself a progressive framework for building user interfaces. Now, in the case of Vue, those user interfaces would be mainly web pages. But let's focus on this progressive framework part for a bit. Because I can imagine that isn't completely clear right away. It basically means that you can start off by adding some tiny bits of view code to an existing application and progressively add more and more if you like. Now I will show you what this means by an example. Let's say you own a web shop and on one page of your shop you have a navigation bar, a product filter and a list of products. But if you wish to add some extra interactivity to your product filter, you can do so by just replacing that part of your website by a Vue.js app. And if you like to, you can just leave it at that. However, you can progressively add more and more Vue elements to your site as you go. And you can even go as far as using Vue for all of your front-end code. Now, how did we get there? In the early days of the internet, websites used to be fairly basic. When you requested a page from a server, the server would return an HTML web page that was either a static HTML file with some CSS obviously, or an HTML file that was rendered by a backend language, such as PHP, Perl, or ASP.NET. Nowadays, Ruby and Python are popular choices for a server-side language as well. And you can even use JavaScript there using Node.js. However, these days we are making web pages much and much fancier by adding some extra interactivity. And we do so by using JavaScript. Now, since we use JavaScript more and more, we also run into common problems whenever we do. These common problems include interactivity on web pages, like showing and hiding modals, data bindings, which is a technique to keep the value of a JavaScript value in sync with some value on your web page, which is a uh, textual value most often. Or this can happen the other way around. You commonly run into this when you are dealing with form inputs, for example, where you want to sync the form value with a JavaScript variable. Another common problem is reusing parts of your HTML code and handling events such as on click events. Now, if you are wondering whether those common problems lead to common solutions, then the answer is definitely no. And that is probably a good thing. Other popular alternatives to a uh, few are Angular and React. Angular was created by Google and the creator of Vue, Evan Yu, drew some of his inspiration for Vue from Angular while he was working at Google. Now, React was created by Facebook, and this is probably the most popular choice at the moment. Whether Vue is right for you uh, mostly depends on the use case you're having for your web project or just your personal preference. But what makes Vue particularly great in my eyes is, among other things, the ease of getting started. Vue in its most basic form doesn't use all too many fancy things. And it is just a small layer on top of essential web technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. 
view is very well documented. The view website covers lots of examples and includes probably all that you need to know. The view ecosystem is very consistent. If you compare this to React, for example, where there are lots of third party dependencies to handle routing and state management. The same components for Vue are plugins maintained by the creator of Vue, so they fit right in. Now, with that all being said, it's time to jump into some more technical topics. It might be good to have a word on the different Vue versions first. Vue version 3 is the default version at the time of me recording this. However, it is still fairly new at this point. So if you are about to start working on an existing project, there is still a good chance that you are happen to get started with Vue 2, or at least encounter code that is still written in a Vue 2 way. And with a Vue 2 way, I mainly mean using the options API. And if you happen to hear this for the first time, no worries. I will get into what this means later on in this course. View 3, on the other hand, was rewritten from the ground up and it implements a new composition API. And that is besides the already existing options API. Now this composition API doesn't exist in Vue 2. And in case you are familiar with React hooks, it is somewhat similar to that. Vue 3 is also rewritten from the ground up using TypeScript instead of JavaScript. And therefore it has great support for TypeScript in your application. Vue 2 has support for TypeScript as well, but it just doesn't work as smoothly as Vue 3. In this course, I won't cover Vue 2 explicitly. However, much has stayed the same. Mainly keep in mind that the composition API has been added in Vue 3 and is therefore not supported in Vue 2. If you start a new project, my advice would be to use Vue 3 unless you really need Vue 2. At this point, all the core libraries are ported to support Vue 3, so that shouldn't be a problem. However, there are reasons to use Vue 2. For example, the need to support Internet Explorer 11. This browser support has been dropped in Vue 3. Or the need for a third party plugin, which doesn't have support for Vue 3 yet. I hope that cleared things up. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome. In this video, we start with some actual coding. This is just a quick demo of what Vue can do, so you can just sit back and relax. All right, first I'll create a new file for our grocery list app called groceries.html. So let's start with an HTML tag and in the head section, we will pull in the view script that is mentioned in the view docs here. Using this script tag, we pull in view version three. Now in our HTML body, we need two sections. First a div with ID app where our view app will mount. And secondly, a script section in which we write our view code. To create our view instance, we need to call view. And this global object is available to us through the script tag we import. And call the function create app, which needs an object as its argument. Secondly, we need to tell where we want our view app to appear on the web page. And we do so by calling the mount function on the view instance we created. And this needs a query selector to indicate the root element of our view instance. And in our case, we want to reference an ID. So therefore the hashtag and the ID we used is app in our div element above. Now let's see where we at. I will save this file and open the live server, which is a plugin to VS Code. And if I check my element inspector here, then 
I see that I get off with just a warning and no errors, luckily. So the first thing that this grocery list app needs is obviously a list. So let's go inside our div where we mount our view instance and create a ordered list with a list item. And as you see, once I save this file, the live server plugin conveniently reloads the file in the browser. Next, let's create some data to pre-fill this list with. And therefore we will use a special function of view called data. And this function needs to return a JavaScript object. And in there we will create the data property items, which will be an array of grocery list items, which in turn will have an ID and a name. And this will be X. We can show the grocery items by looping over the items data property. And we do so by using the V4 view directive. View directives are special HTML attributes and you use them to tell Vue how to render certain parts of your HTML. Now, generally you can identify them by the V dash they start with. Now let's look over our items. For each item in our grocery items array, we are gonna print out the item name. And as you see now, the X are showing up in our list now. Now we need to make a small addition to our for loop. That is, we should bind the ID of an item to a special HTML attribute called key. Now you bind by using the vbind directive and we can set it equal to item.id. This allows Vue to more efficiently re-render the list once a single item changes in our list. Now for vbind, there is a special shortcut because this is used quite often. That is for vbind, the semicolon is just sufficient. However, keep in mind that this is the same as writing vbind. So our grocery app is somewhat limited. That is, there is no real way to add new items to our grocery list. So let's change that. Let's create a new list item underneath the for loop and in there create a form with a text input. So once we submit this form, we want to call a method that adds the item to the items data property. So let's start by creating this method. View looks for methods in the methods property of the view app. So in here, let's create a new method called add item. And in here, we want to reference the items data property. And we do so by using this dot items. And on this array, we can just call the push method that is available on JavaScript arrays. Our grocery list items are expected to have an ID. And here I will generate a random number and a name. And for this, I will need a new data property, which I will call new item. So let's create that here, new item, and set that equal to an empty string. So let's save that and we see our form input showing up in our HTML file. In order to get our form to work now, we need to handle the onSubmit action of the form. And we do so by entering at submit.prevent and the name of the method we just created. So what's going on here is that add is again a shorthand, just like the colon here for vbind, the add is a shorthand for von. But I generally prefer the shorthand add. And the dot prevent here is a special modifier, which prevents the default action of the event. And in the case of a form that would be submitting an HTTP request, which we don't want at this point. We just want to call our own method. 
the second thing we need in order to get our form to work is to create a two-way data binding of the value of the text input and the value of the new item data property. And what makes it two-way is that once we update the value of the text input, the new item variable should change. And once we change new item in our code, the value of the form input should change. For this, we have a view directive as well called v model. And here we specify that we should bind to new item. Now we forgot one thing here. So now that this new item is two way binded, we also need to make sure that we clear the input once we added a new item to our list of grocery items. And we do so by setting new item back to an empty string. So let's double check this now. If I would were to add milk, press enter, then the item milk is added to our list of grocery items. Before we wrap up, let's also allow to check off items of our list. And to do so, we create a new input of type checkbox in our for loop. And we also create a two way binding here using fee model to item dot checked. So for our X that is pre existing in our list, let's create an extra attribute, set it to false, as well as for the newly created items in our list. And to visualize the effects here, let's create a label, move the item name in there, and create some dynamic styling here. So we are gonna bind the style attribute of the label to a JavaScript object in which we have text decoration and here we are going to check whether the item is checked. And if that is the case, we want to apply the style line true. And if item checked is false, we will apply none as a text decoration. So no more text decoration. Let's save. We now have a checkbox for X. And as you see, once we check it, the text is strike true. And the same should happen for items we create to our list as well. So with that, I uh, will see you in the next video. Let's have a quick word on your local development environment as well, starting with your code editor. So I list a couple alternatives for you here, starting with Visual Studio Code not to be confused with Visual Studio. This is created by Microsoft, is completely free and quite popular at the moment. One that is somewhat similar is Atom, created by GitHub and pretty cool too. Another great choice is Sublime Text. This editor is also pretty minimal like Visual Studio Code and Atom, and it has a unlimited free trial, so you can try it out as long as you want to. However, if you decide to pick this editor for real, um, try to pay for it and support the developers. Another choice, which is a commercial product, is WebStorm. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, but they make great stuff. This one is um, a bit more packaged with all that you need. It has great JavaScript support, a few support built in, so not per se the need to add it using extensions like you would. Another great option would be WebStorm by JetBrains, which is a more commercial product. I have no affiliation with them, but they just make great stuff. So you can try this out as well. It has great support built in for JavaScript and Vue, and you can literally just start right away instead of the need to install plugins or so. So beside your code editor, something that is really useful are the few dev tools in your browser. So 
you can find them in the Chrome Web Store or for Firefox and they allow you to inspect your view application in more detail. So once you install it, you should see the DevTools extension in your top bar and in your element inspector, there should be a view top. And with this view top, you should be able to inspect the data properties and computed properties and components in your view application, which is really useful. So lastly, there are a couple Visual Studio Code extensions, which I would like to mention because they make your life uh, a bit easier when editing code. Now, if you didn't pick Visual Studio Code, you can take a look at the Vue community website and I will include a link for this. Uh, but they have some information about how to properly set up Atom or Sublime Text for Vue files. So in Visual Studio Code, the first extension, which you can find under the extensions tab and in the marketplace, you need to search for Vitor. And Vitor is Vue tooling. It includes a Vue language server and some other features like syntax highlighting, for example. Another one is ESLint. And later on, we will use this to automatically format your code. The live server plugin, which I used in our previous example, um, is another one. This is not per se very convenient. So for example, if you would were to make a change here, it automatically reloads your page. But as you see, it removes your dynamic properties. So later on, we'll see how to fix that. But if you're working with static HTML files, this one uh, could be useful as well. Nice, you made it to the section about few essentials. In this section, we will get into the essential workings of a single view component. We will use the grocery list example from the previous section as a starting point to explain these concepts. For now, we will only stick to the view options API and not yet the composition API. In my opinion, the composition API is easier to learn when you are already up to speed with the options API. Besides that, lots of code snippets that you currently can find on Stack Overflow and similar websites predate the Composition API. So being able to translate concepts from the Options API to the Composition API is more useful than the other way around. With that being said, let's get started. Let's have a word on reactivity in Vue and reactivity relates to the data that is returned by the special data method in Vue. This is also sometimes called your local state. Whenever Vue notices a change in one of these values, it makes sure to re-render your template. And Vue does this by creating an intermediate layer for each of these data properties called a proxy. And this proxy object is the thing you interact with whenever you call items on this or new item on this. There are already two things that you should avoid here. And the first thing is using arrow functions for your methods. Now, if you're not familiar with arrow functions, they look something like this. However, Vue binds this to the right component instance. And it can only do that if you use regular functions instead of arrow functions. The second is to not prefix your data properties with an underscore or a dollar sign, because Vue uses these for internal properties already. Now we already saw some of this reactivity already with adding new items to our list and binding the V model to new item. But let's visualize this a bit more and create a paragraph in which we will print out the number of items in our list. 
So let's start by the double curly braces, which we use to print some text. And in there, we want to access items and ask for the length of the array. And next, we just write a hard coded string. All right. As you see now, it says that there is one item in our list, which is the eggs. And once we add milk, you see that this number is automatically updated through this data property. In the previous video, we added the items length expression to our component template. And well, here this expression is quite simple still. At some point, expressions in your template can get somewhat out of hand. And Vue has something for this as well, called computed properties. And in your Vue component, they should live under the computed key. So let's refactor that expression in our template to total amount of items as a computed property. And that should return this dot items dot length. Now in our template, we can replace this by that computed property. So total amount of items. So if we would were to add milk again, then you see that this still works. So just like your component data, computer properties are reactive, which makes them great to simplify the logic in your view template. Now let's take this one step further. As you see, uh, we've been somewhat lazy here with the S between parentheses in items. So let's move this whole message to a computed property as well. So here we are gonna write that string again, and I'm using template literals here. So that's with a backtick instead of a quote. And this allows for string interpolation. In other words, writing variables directly inside our string template. So you do that by a dollar sign followed by the curly braces. And in here, I want to reference the computed property that we created below. So that's total amount of items. And here I'll just type the rest of the string. Now, what we want to check for is whether that total amount of items is equal to one. And if so, we want to return a different string. So again, I'm gonna reference that computed property. And if that is equal to one, then I'm gonna make an exception to that rule. And there I'll just write item instead of items. Now back in our template, we can replace the hard-coded string with that computed property. And now if I save and I'll enter milk to our list, you see that it still works. Now one side note here is that we could have created methods instead of computed properties. And this can work perfectly fine as well. So if we would were to move this to the method section, then instead of referencing a computed property, we are calling a method here. So we need to add parentheses. And again, in our template code as well, and you see that this works perfectly fine too. However, Vue caches the return value of computed properties and only re-evaluates them whenever a reactive dependency of that computed property changes. That reactive dependency can be another computed property or a data item. 
So you have somewhat of a performance gain when re-rendering your template if you use computed properties. So here where we don't need to use methods, let's move this back to computed properties and remove the parentheses to get this working properly again. Don't forget the one in our template and this still works fine. And with that, I'll see you in the next video. Let's talk about conditional rendering. Conditional rendering allows you to show or hide certain parts of your HTML template. And just like with for loops, conditionals are available to you in the form of view directives. Let's start with this ordered list. Currently, we always render this element. However, we can decide to only do so whenever there are items available. In other words, whenever the length of the items array is not zero. So luckily we created a computed property total amount of items before, which hold the amount of items in our items array. So let's add a check for this. The condition starts with V dash, indicating a view directive, followed by if. And afterwards it holds the condition. So let's add that total amount of items computed property. And we only want to show this element whenever total amount of items is not equal to zero. So if I save this now, then the change should be applied. However, we pre-filled our items array with one element. So let's remove that. And now you see that both the list is gone, including the form. So let's take that out for now, because we want to be able to add new items, even if the list is empty. All right, that looks better. So this list, ordered list, should reappear whenever we add an item to our list again. So let's enter X and that works as expected. However, if you noticed, whenever our list is empty, we are still showing this message, which might be a bit overkill. So let's hide this one whenever the list is empty as well. And for that, we will use a different directive, namely V show. And that will have the same condition as the list. However, instead of repeating ourselves, let's create a computed property for this. And we need to prefix, prefix that with this to reference this computed property. And in our conditions, let's call that computed property. And as you see, now that message has appeared as well and it reappears when we add an item to our list. Now, why use vif here and vshow here? Turns out there is a small functional difference between the two. And to see this, we need to dive in our element inspector. So in our app, we see that that paragraph is present here that is hidden by the v show directive. However, that v if completely makes sure that that ordered list is not present in our HTML code. And that is the difference between the two. So v show only hides the piece of your template by using CSS, while vif makes sure that it is not rendered at all. And it appears once that condition evaluates to true. So now you see that the ordered list appears here and that the style section of the paragraph is removed. So what reasons are there to prefer one over the other? 
and this has to do with the cost of rendering. As you see, VShow does create the part of your template that you're hiding. It just toggles it off by using CSS. On the other hand, VIF deletes and creates your piece of template completely. So if the condition happens to change a lot during the lifetime of the component, VIF is a bit slower because it has to create and destroy that part of your template completely. However, VShow does pay a little bit of that cost on the initial rendering time. So whenever your component is created. Now, besides VIF for conditions, we have two more options being V else if and V else. The first one requires a condition as well. And the other one is just whenever a previously defined VIF evaluates to false. So let's try that out here. So whenever the list of items is empty, let's show a message list is empty. And we want to do that whenever has items is false. So whenever this condition returns to false, then we fall back on this condition. So let's save that. And as you see, we now render list is empty. And whenever we add an element, this part of our code is not rendered anymore. And the list of items is shown. During this series so far, I have used words like mounting and rendering to describe the state of a view component. This wasn't completely random. These words match up pretty nice with the stages in the component lifecycle in Vue. Vue adds, replaces, and removes HTML code from our web page. And that process follows a specific structure each time. This is called the component lifecycle. And you can see it visualized on the right side of my screen. Pretty nice here. This image is taken from the Vue documentation. Besides that it is just useful to know that this happens in the background, Vue allows us to hook into this process as well. And we can do so by declaring lifecycle hooks. Lifecycle hooks are just regular methods in our Vue app, which have a name that matches up with the state that is described on the left side of my screen here. So for example, there is a mounted hook that will be called by Vue at the time that our Vue component is mounted to our web page. So if you would were to log my component is mounted, then we should see that appear in our element inspector. And the same goes for the other lifecycle stages. So there is a created as well. And in real life, this might be a useful place to make an API call, for example. But for now, let's make a logging statement here as well. And as you see, that function is also called by few. Thank you for signing up to this course and great work reaching the end. Now stay tuned because more content will follow soon. I hope to see you there.